2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Last week, we looked at our duty, our responsibility, and it was to be ambassadors. And we took some time and we looked at what an ambassador was and we compared what an ambassador was, for instance, the United States to another country to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. Paul says, hey, we are now, I'll read it, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so last week we looked at what that meant to be an ambassador and what our job is and how our responsibility is two things. One, we represent the sovereignty of the nation that we come from. And so as believers, we represent the sovereignty of the kingdom of heaven, the sovereignty of God. That means all that God is, all his characteristics, all the names that he has, we represent that. So when we step in the room, we are bringing El Shaddai, Elohim, uh, uh, Jehovah Sikhanu, Jehovah Rapha. Uh, 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 we're bringing all that in the room. Why? Because Paul said that we are ambassadors. And so I have to remember that when I show up somewhere, who I'm bringing with me the sovereignty of the kingdom of heaven. The second one is not only are we bringing the sovereignty of the kingdom of heaven, but we're also representing our king. That means when I step in the room, God steps in the room. And we talked about how painfully <laughs> uh, uh, frightening that is and the responsibility and the weight that comes with who I represent when I step in the room. And so Paul says we are ambassadors and our job, he tells us in verse 20, is to make his appeal. I like what he says there. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. That since there means it's not like a choice. <laughs> it's not like, you know, and if you are OK with it, God would like you to make the appeal for him. No. Paul said, oh, this is this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> Whether you like it or not, this is what's happening. You are making an appeal for God. The question is, how is my appeal? Is my appeal lined up with the appeal that God wants me to make? What is that appeal? Well, first of all, the word appeal there, um, it means a, a serious or an urgent request. There is something serious. OK, there's something urgent that God has said, Olu, as my ambassador, Naya, as my ambassador. Here is the urgent request. Here is the uh, a serious plea that I need you to make to the kingdom that you're in. It's not a suggestion. It's an urgent plea. And so as the ambassador, every action, every, every action I do, every comment that I make, every word I say, every demeanor, okay, every response is a serious, urgent request from God. Paul says, since God is making his appeal through us. So every time I open my mouth, God is talking. God is pleading. Every time uh, uh, I give advice, when I give my advice, it's as if God is giving that advice. When I give my point of view, it is as if God is giving his point of view. Paul says, since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. The plea, the urgent request, the serious message that our king has instructed us to give the people at the kingdom that we're, at, that we're in is be reconciled to God. There are two categories. OK, and this is what the appeal is. There's the in Christ. And there's the in trespasses and sin. OK, the appeal reconciliation. And we talked about this a little last week to rec to be reconciled means that that enmity that was between us, that hostility that between us, that was between us, that animosity that was between us, that opposition that was between us has been exchanged for peace. Reconcile. I changed something. OK. The Bible tells us we need to be reconciled to God. The reason why, because there's two categories. There's the in Christ, what God wants us to be, and then there's the in trespasses and sin. Now, trespasses and sin, 
we, we use those words interchangeably sometimes. They both mean sins. But I like how uh, uh, in the Bible it, it specifies the two, specifies the two. So, for instance, trespass has to do with, think about our sign, no trespassing. If I see a no trespassing sign, what does that mean? That means I can walk here and I'm not supposed to go over here because that's trespassing. I'm going somewhere I shouldn't be. And so when we look at sin as trespass, a trespass is in we're on a path or where we should be and we decide, eh, I'm going to go this way. Oh, I know the right thing to do. I'm going to choose to do the wrong thing. I know the right way I'm supposed to be going. I'm going to go the wrong way. That's what trespass is. And so when we sin, or the trespass is though I'm going where I should go, and then I decide to get off that path or to veer off that path. Okay? Sin, when we look at the original language, has the idea of missing the mark. We talk about that. Uh, uh, bow and arrow, there's a target there. I pull it back. I, I miss it every time. And Paul uses that word to talk about sin and the fact that what we try to do, the mark that we try to reach, which is the righteousness of God, we miss it every single time. No matter what I do, I cannot hit the mark. I cannot be where I'm supposed to be on my own. And so where we are, where we start off is in trespasses and sin. Where we need to be is in Christ. Reconciliation is when God takes you from here, separate from him. And brings you here. That's what reconciliation is. To reconcile to God. That enmity, that uh, uh, opposition is done away with and I'm in Christ. And so when we look at Ephesians, um, I'll just talk to you a little about where we're supposed to be. Why God wants us to be reconciled to us. Because in Christ, in him, there are certain things. I want to read this chapter because we may or may not have read Ephesians chapter 1 a couple of times. I can't remember, but Paul says, I'm going to shoot through it real quick. See if you can follow me. Verse three, blessed is the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. So where what's in Christ? All the spiritual blessings that are in heaven for he chose us in him. Where are we chosen? We're chosen in Christ before when the foundation of the world to be holy, blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as his son through Jesus Christ for himself. Where was that? Oh, that's in him. According to his good pleasure in his will, to the praise of the glorious grace that he lavished on us in where? In the beloved one, in him. Then verse seven, in him. Whoa, there we are again. We have redemption through the blood. What else do we have in him? The forgiveness of our trespasses. We just talked about that word. According to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out in us with all wisdom and understanding. And he talks about he made us know the mystery of his will, verse 20, as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and on earth. Verse 11, in him, what else do we have, Paul? We also received an inheritance because we are predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. Verse 13, in him, you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your, the gospel of your salvation when you believe. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Paul says in him, in him, in him, in him, in him, in him, in him. This is where God wants. This is the message. This is the appeal. God wants us. God wants the world. God wants us to be in him. And so as an ambassador, the pill I'm making is, hey, kingdom I'm in, the kingdom of earth. It's a God who wants to end the war, who wants to end the opposition, who wants to end the enmity between you two and exchange it for peace. And that peace can be found in him. So I'm not going to list all those things that are in Christ that we just read, but I'll just put, look at Ephesians chapter one, <laughs> but peace in Christ. So we look at the other one, the in trespass and sin. Well, what's going on in that world? Why do we need to be reconciled? Where are we currently initially? Well, Paul goes in verse two and says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. Where? In trespasses and sin, you were dead, in which you previously lived according to the rays of the world, according to the rule of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. He goes on to say, uh, uh, you were children of wrath, under the wrath as others were also, verse 3. 
We were dead. We made us alive in Christ. Even though we were dead in trespasses, you were saved by grace. Verse uh, five. And so when we look at the original state, we are at war with God. Enmity, good word. Opposition. Animosity. Okay. Against God. Paul said there are works of disobedience. That's what we did. Works of disobedience. In Christ, Paul tells us in Romans, our responsibility now is works of righteousness. Paul said we were dead to sin. Dead in sin, I'm sorry. Over here, alive. Where? <laughs> in Christ. Because that's where we're at. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about in Christ. Slaves to sin. And then Romans chapter 6 also says to righteousness. We are opposed to God and all that he is. And that's his character. This is where we start off in trespasses and in sin. And over here, we are in harmony with God and all that he is. In trespasses and sin. And in Christ. Back in 2 Corinthians, Paul says our message, our appeal is world, kingdom of this earth. God wants to reconcile with you. You need to be reconciled to God. OK, we left God. Garden of Eden. God said, this is what I want to do. I made this for you. Here's my way. Follow my way. Everything's going to be good. Adam looked out and said, you know what, God? I see your way. I hear your way, but I want to do my own thing. So adios to your way, God. I'm going my way. And that's when the enmity came. That's when the war began. That's when the opposition began. So therefore, every child of Adam and their child and their child and their child and their child and their child, all the way down to you and I, start off on this side, separate from God in our trespasses, and in our sin. But on Christ's behalf, we plead. And I like that what he says in verse 21, back to 2 Corinthians 5. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that where? In him, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the gospel message right there. The plead, our appeal is the gospel. Hey, kingdom of the earth, you over here. God is over here. There's enmity, there's a war, there's opposition, there's animosity between you two. But God, in his love, Paul said, he made him who knew not sin to be sin. God said, I'm going to take their trespasses, and I'm going to take their sin, and I'm going to take their works of disobedience, and I'm going to take their dead, filthy, stinking carcasses, and the slavery they are, and their opposition to God, and myself, and who I am, and I'm going to take all that, and I'm going to put it upon myself, and I'm going to go to a cross, and I'm going to die and shed blood because of the fact that the only way that sins can be forgiven, the only way that reconciliation can be had is if someone dies. And that someone who dies had to be someone who is eternal, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, sinless, and at the same time, has to be a man. And so Christ came down, Philippians chapter 2, and he took off his glory robe, and he went and he died. Paul said he made him who was sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The appeal, the message is we have to be in Christ. And that's what we have to say. And that's why our responsibility to tell people. In trespasses of sin, we say that we are, people are opposed to God and all that he is in his character. And that's the problem. Because, in, because they're opposed to God and opposed to his character, then things that line up to the character of God, you can't do over here. Oh, you can't do it godly. For instance, we talk about justice. You hear a lot of talk about justice right now. We need justice. We have to look for justice. Yes, we do. But guess what? Justice is a character of God. God is just. That means the only true justice is godly justice and who God is. And so true biblical godly justice is represented by God. Where is that at? That's over here. So in order for true, biblical, godly 
Justice is wrong, I'm on the wrong side. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I passed my blue tape. Thanks, Lois, for letting me know. The only way we can get true biblical godly justice is in Christ. Oh, you can have justice light. You can have some elements of justice. You can have something that looks like justice or, or kind of on the surface is justice, but your justice will not be true. It will not be godly and will not be biblical unless you are in Christ. So my appeal, God is just. So, yes, I'm going to talk about justice and I'm going to look out. And when I see injustice, I'm going to speak on it. Why? Because the person I represent from the kingdom I'm from, he's just. And so I have to stand. When I see injustice, I have to say something. Why? Because I'm representing God. What will God say when he sees injustice? That's what I say when I see injustice. But when it comes to, that's not my appeal, though. That's what we have to understand. The appeal is, oh, you need to be reconciled to God. That's the main message I'm bringing along. We talk about her unity today. A lot of talk about unity. We need to bring the country together. It's got to be unity. We will fight it. We need that unity. How are we going to do it? Who's going to bring us back together? We need unity. Unity is cool and it's good. Matter of fact, the Bible says that God is one. Jesus even said it when he was praying. Father, I hope that they, I pray that they will be one, just like you and I are one. One, same mindset, same accord, same vision, same idea, same direction. But guess what? True, biblical, godly unity only comes in Christ. So when I see, what's the opposite of unity? I was going to say disunity. It's not a word. What's, give me a word. Opposite of unity. Division. That's it. <laughs> when I see division, do I speak out? Yes. Because the king from the kingdom I represent is one. And so when I see division, when I see conflict, I speak out against it. But that's not my the appeal. That's not the main message. The main message is, oh, you need to be reconciled to God. Good. Goodness. God is good. If y'all in the Baptist church, you would have said all the time. And then you say all the time. God is good. Come on, y'all. Let's get on it. <laughs> You're slipping. <laughs> Goodness. Okay. God is good. That's who God is. And so when I see my job is to look for goodness. And when I see badness, when I see things going wrong, not going how they should be, I, as an ambassador for the king of goodness, I'm supposed to step in and say something and bring that sovereignty of the kingdom I come from about being good. But my appeal is reconciliation to God. That's got to be our main focus. Everything I say, if I'm talking about unity, if I'm talking about justice, if I'm talking about goodness, if I'm talking about happiness, whatever I'm talking about, I have to take all that and make sure that it's under the umbrella of the appeal. We need to be, you need to be, the world needs to be reconciled to God. We need to ensure that the appeal is the main focus, then all the other appeals can be addressed, be addressed. Because with reconciliation comes the righteousness of God. That's what Paul said. He said, look at the end of verse 21. He had made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God, the standard. The only standard that God accepts is righteousness. We can become the righteousness of God where? In Christ. I gave my life to Christ many years ago. 47. Good gracious. 41 years ago. 1980, March 9th. I remember. No. Yeah. March 9th? Yeah, March 9th. I didn't know all that I was doing, but I knew that there was some times I went off the path of righteousness. <laughs> And I should probably stay there. So I said, God, help me stay there. And through the years, I learned, I studied the word, I got more closer to God. I've been to go through things and understand what I decided, the decision I made when I was six years old. In that decision, as I've been in Christ, my responsibility, once I became in Christ, I also became an ambassador. And my job is to go over to this kingdom and say, hey, guys, 
God needs to reconcile with you. With reconciliation comes the righteousness of God, a new creature. Paul says it. We are a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things become new. The fullness of the Godhead. Heart of stone should be turned to a heart of flesh. That's Old Testament. He said, I'll take your heart of stone. Over here, you got a stone heart. Kind of hard to get people with stone hearts to do things, especially live how you're supposed to live in Christ. But the prophet said, God said, I will take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Without those the righteousness of God, new creature, fullness of the Godhead, and the heart of flesh. Without those things, without being in Christ, any racial sensitivity is superficial. It's a facade. It's empty. It lacks substance. It has no roots. It's actually pharisaical. I learned that word. It means like Pharisees. It means hypocritical. Any unity is superficial. Any justice it's empty and it lacks the substance that it needs. Or it looks good on the surface, but deep, deep down, there's no roots there. That means at any time, what looked like justice can be injustice. What looked like unity could be division. What looked like racial sensitivity could be racism. What looks like love could be the actually opposite hate. Why? Because over here, we don't have those things that we have in Christ. The result of that and the purpose of that is to remind us as ambassadors, I have to remember the appeal and the appeal needs to be the main thing that comes out of my mouth and all other many appeals. We need to be good. We need to have unity. We need to be justice. We need to end racial. Uh, 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 we need to end violence. All that kind of stuff. Those are appeals. Those are great. And we need to do that. But we cannot let those overshadow the appeal. Reconciliation to God. You, kingdom of the earth, you're on your way to hell because there's a war between you and God. And it's more than God that wants to be your friend. It's more than God loves you. The reason he did this is because he loves you. But the problem isn't that you weren't loved by God. Because guess what? God is love. So whether you're over here or over here, God loves you. <laughs> so that's not the problem. That's not the issue. The issue is though God loves you, you are at war with him, kingdom of the earth. You are in opposition to him. He loves you with all that he is, but you are spitting in his face because you remain worker of disobedience, dead to sin, a slave to sin, opposed to all he is. And so kingdom of the earth, I am here as an ambassador for my king, God, from the kingdom of heaven to say you need to be reconciled. You need to allow Christ to take that sin in exchange, like we talked about last week, your sin, your shame. The animosity, the opposition, the war, exchange that for peace. And exchange you from being a slave to sin to a slave from righteousness. Exclaim works of disobedience to works of righteousness. That exchange needs to be there. That's my message. And that needs to be first and all other messages is second. Olu, is there a biblical example of that? I'm glad you asked. Turn to John chapter 4. You guys asked a great question at the right time. In John chapter four, and this is kind of sliding into our John's Gospel of John series before Corona hit. We were finishing chapter three. I think we finished chapter three and we we're about to start chapter four. And so this is just a wonderful segue right into it. You know the story. It's Jesus and a woman at the well. And as I read this as an example, I begin to, and looking at it in light of where we are today, I begin to see some interesting things because there are some people, there are some preachers, there are some churches who are looking at what's going on in the world and they're spending a lot of time and a lot of effort on those appeals, lowercase t, the, and lowercase a, appeals. And it seems as though they're making the lowercase appeals to be their number one message. And the number one area. And you see people talking about, you know, America, to, America this and America that. And you see people talking about, uh, we need to do this for America. We see people talking about, uh, 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 we need to do this and do this and, and, and attack this and use this. And I'm hearing them and I'm not hearing it in light of the appeal, capital T, capital A, in light of reconciliation. And so I said, okay, what did Christ do? So here we go. John chapter four, the woman at the well. This woman, she had what I like, what I call the quad factor. I don't know if that's the word. Trifecta is a word. That means three. I'm going with quad factor. 
There were four things that was wrong with her, okay, when Jesus rolled up on her, okay? Four things. One, she had the influence, she, had, she was under the influence of racial disparities. She had some issues with race. Sounds familiar. What's going on today? And what Jesus did in each one of these things, these four things, he went with the need, the appeal, the appeal for the second one. He addressed her obvious sin, and then he went back to the appeal. And then the appeal again. And we're going to see that. Appeal, appeal, condemn the sin, appeal, appeal. For all four of those things that she had areas that she had issues with. So the first one was... Uh, 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 racial disparity or racial injustice. Look at John chapter 4, verse 7. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone to town to buy food. And she said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with the Samaritans. Off the bat, we got racism. Off the bat, we got some racial problems, some racial in in injustices, some racial sensitivities with this woman. How did Jesus approach that? She said, hey, man, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. We don't talk to us, each other. Matter of fact, you don't talk to me. I ain't talking to you. What you even talking to me? So because of their race, there was some issues there. What did Jesus say? Now, today, some people may approach that differently. Oh, this person has a racial problem? Huh. Let me take this time and break down the racial issue. And we need to fix this race problem right now, which was OK to do. But let's see what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God and who was saying to you, give me drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Jesus didn't even touch that. Now, you say, OK, well, that's cool. He said living water. Well, what's that mean? Well, you have to remember this is, old, this is pre cross. So what Jesus is saying, there are words that he's saying that as a Jew or a Samaritan living in a time, it catch phrases. For instance, living water. Turn with me quick. Keep your finger there. Go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Isaiah, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, the prophet Jeremiah was talking. And he said, listen. Verse 13, Jeremiah 2, 13, for my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, uh -oh, abandonment, separate from God. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. Turn over a couple of chapters to uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. That's that living water Jesus talked about. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. The prophet is talking, he's talking to God. He said, uh, Lord, the hope of Israel, all who abandon you will be put to shame. All who turn away from me will be written in the dirt, for they have abandoned the Lord, the fountain of what? Living water. Jesus heard about her racial issue and he went straight to, oh, no, 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 no. I've got the living water and the living water combats that abandonment. So you've abandoned me. You abandoned God. There's a problem. The problem isn't the racial disparity. The problem is that you have abandoned God and you need reconciliation. Guess what? I'm that living water that's going to bring that reconciliation. That's the first thing he did. Secondly, she has some issues with historical influences of heritage. Sounds familiar? Her rights as a people group or her ancestor, ancestors. Okay? She went on to say, Sir, verse 11, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Oh, you don't know my heritage. Okay. I've come from this. I have certain rights because of who I am and my ancestry and the people group. Heard a lot of that today. We got to make America greater. We got to take it back. We got to. Jesus said, I hear all that. Did Jesus respond to that? <laughs> Not at all. Look what Jesus said. 
everyone who drinks from this water, he's back to the living water again. He's <laughs> like, like yeah, yeah, okay, listen, 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 let's get back to the point. Everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again, but whoever drinks from the water that I will give them will never thirst again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Jesus took her racial insensitivities and said, the problem isn't that, ma'am. You want to talk about that? That's not the problem. The problem is you have abandoned me. You need reconciliation. Jesus took her historical ancestral heritage that she had puffed her chest out about it. Jesus said, I don't care nothing about that. Well, he didn't say that. Jesus said, that's not the important thing right now. Jesus said, you need eternal life. Why? Because you are, have abandoned me. There's some separation there. There's war there. You are on your way dead to sin. She kept going. Sir, give me this water. So I'm going to get thirsty and come here to draw water. And then Jesus, verse 16, go call your husband and come back here. So notice what Jesus did. She came with this racial stuff. Jesus said, you uh, reconciliation, the appeal. She came with historical stuff. Jesus said, reconciliation, the appeal. And then Jesus said, right now, I'm going to take some time. And we're going to talk about this obvious, visible sin in your life. He said, go call your husband. She said, uh, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. So you had five husbands and the man you now are living with is not your husband. So what you have said to me is true. Jesus acknowledged, watch this, and he condemned the blatant, obvious, visible sin in her life. Now that's, whoo, you don't do that today. You're not supposed to judge people. That's not your, that's not your job. You just give them love. That's Old Testament. Give them love. You know, you can, the Bible says, come as you are. So as you are, just let them be as they are. Why would you tell somebody they shouldn't be living this lifestyle of sin? How dare you? Don't bring that up. Don't condemn that. It's not my job to condemn. It's not my place to judge. Be true to yourself. You know what? Because there's so many hypocrites in the church anyway. You know, all them hypocrites in the church. So I'm not going to be one of those hypocrites. I've done some dirt. You've done some dirt. So listen, I'm not even going to address that. I'm just going to love you and forget everything else. I just want to be your friend. Jesus said that yeah, you brought up the racial stuff and we knocked that down with the appeal, reconciliation. You brought up historical stuff, I knocked it down with appeal. And now you come with this, I want to address this sin in your life. See, Jesus, because again, we're talking about ambassadors for Christ. This is Christ. This is who we're supposed to be representing. When he fell upon this woman and an obvious sin was in her life, he said, be reconciled, be reconciled. Oh, and what you're doing right now is wrong. You got to stop it. I'm not going to placate it. I'm not going to make it look pretty. He calls her straight out. You're right. You ain't married. Plus, you've been had five husbands and the dude you're sleeping with now ain't your husband. Oh, that's he was all up in her business. But that's what we're supposed to do. Because I'm an ambassador for that guy who was at the well who called that woman out on her sin. So what am I supposed to do when I see obvious sin? I'm supposed to say something. Because I'm an ambassador. I'm supposed to do what Jesus would do. So I don't let obvious, blatant, visible sin just go by. I got to say something. Why? Because I'm an ambassador. Why? Because the appeal needs to be made. She won't finish yet. She said, Jesus, <laughs> sir, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain. But the Jews said that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. So again, she came with now some religious things. She came with some ideological misunderstandings, some misrepresentations. She came with this. Let's go. Let's debate on this level. The ideology, the religion. The, the, Jesus said, I hear all that. And that's important, and we'll get to that. But look what Jesus said. Jesus said, believe me, woman, <laughs> the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. But an hour is coming, verse 23, and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Jesus said, listen, it's not about where. I'm not even concerned about that right now. It's about who. Are you worshiping God? What did he do? He always brought it back to the appeal. Our responsibilities, church, 
as ambassadors for Christ, as we come up with racial issues, as we come up with historical issues, as we come up with obvious, blatant, visible sin, as we come up with ideological, ideology, ideology, can somebody help me out? Thank you. I can't even say that. But what Kelly just said, ideological, it just got to go slower. That's all. I'm going too fast. Ideological misrepresentations. All those things are important and need to be addressed. But what did Jesus do? Where was his emphasis? His emphasis throughout that entire dialogue was the appeal, the appeal, the appeal, the appeal. You need to be reconciled to God. We need to know our role. How do we do this? My role as the ambassador, I am the personal representative of Yahweh, Jehovah, God, creator of the universe. Every morning you wake up, you should say that. Wake up, feed the floor. I am the personal representative, representative of Jehovah, Yahweh, God, creator of the universe. And then open the door and do what you do. Every time you have to pick up the phone and talk to somebody, I am the personal representative of Jehovah, Yahweh, God, creator of the universe. Hello. Every single time. Why? Because that's my responsibility. That's my duty. I am supposed to exercise the authority of my sending ruler. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority is given to me and I'm telling you, go into all the world. Titus, whoo, Titus 2.5. You ain't got to turn there. We're closing. But I, I got to read it. Titus 2.5. This is the most offensive chapter in the Bible. Nobody wants to hear this today. But in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says, uh, proclaim these things, encourage and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. Paul says, take what it says in this book. Take your responsibility as an ambassador. Encourage and rebuke. Why? Because I represent Jehovah, Yahweh God, creator of the universe. I must represent God equally with the same fervor and the same uh, emotion on every issue, be it something I agree with, something I don't agree with, something that I would normally do, something I normally wouldn't do. All forms, when I speak those words, I'm speaking the words of God itself. And so if I'm talking about racism, I speak what God says on that in light of reconciliation, whether I like it or agree with it or not. When I talk about homosexuality, all forms of that, I speak on what God says on that, not me, because I don't represent what I think or what I feel or what I think should happen. I represent what God says. When I look at injustice, all lives matter, black lives matter. Listen, God said God is a God of justice. And so I'm speaking, I'm bringing the sovereignty of the kingdom of heaven. No matter what side it is, listen, justice is the reason why. Because you need to be in Christ because of who he is and to be in harmony with his character of justice. When we look at murder, when we look at all those things, I represent him, the same God from the same kingdom with the same appeal. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Call out sin, yes, like Jesus did. But notice, even though he called out that sin, it was that call out of sin in her life was surrounded by the appeal. He wasn't just going around. You a sinner. You a sinner. You a sinner. You a sinner. You. It was all bathed in the appeal. Call out sin. Yes. But not for the sake of just calling out sin. Speak truth to power. Yes. But not just for the sake of speaking truth to power. Confront injustice. Yes. But not just for the sake of confronting Injustice, righteousness is the key that drives us. Reconciliation is the key that drives us because we are ambassadors for Christ. Father, we thank you, God, for your word. God, we know this responsibility that you've given us is heavy, but you've given us your spirit to strengthen us, the fullness of the Godhead, to give us the energy that we need to represent you, God. God, this was going to put us in sticky situations uncomfortable situations. We thank you that your word has already given us the authority to both encourage and to rebuke because we don't represent this kingdom. We don't represent this earth. I don't represent Olu or Olu's kingdom. God, your word said that I represent Jehovah, Yahweh, God, the creator of the universe. So I pray, God, as the body of Christ, as we move out this week into this foreign kingdom that we're in, that we will remember every morning, every noon, every night that we are ambassadors, God. 
and that we will make the appeal, reconciliation to God, the first and foremost and main and priority thing in our life, in our actions, in our conversation. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.